Well, hello, everyone. I'm Marvin Thomas, Heritage Planning and Policy Advisor at the Ministry of Parks, Culture and Sport, the Heritage Conservation Branch. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first day of our winter webinar series. So to begin, I do acknowledge that in Regina, where I'm located, we're in Treaty 4 territory, traditional lands of the Cree, the Nakoda, Dakota, Lakota, the Anishinaabe and homeland of the Métis. And wherever you are, I do encourage you too to reflect on those long and deep connections that Indigenous people have to those lands. Thank you. So in these webinars, we'll be hearing about historic places that are located in communities of all sizes from across Saskatchewan. And they're different in many ways, but they're all important for their ability to connect us with our history and to help us learn important things about the past. But they aren't just relics of the past. As you'll see, they continue to play important roles in their communities today. And they remind us that Historic places needn't be thought of as impediments to development. In fact, they can be valuable assets for community development. And the ministry is very grateful to the people who took the time to be with us today to share the stories of these places and to tell us how they're creating value for their owners and their communities. We have two presentations today. They're about projects that are much different in scale, but they're both valued for their contributions that they make to their communities. Now, before I introduce our first speaker, I'll just remind our guests, please keep your uh, microphones and cameras turned off during the presentations. There'll be time for questions at the end of the hour. So I'll ask you to hold your questions until then. And you can also put questions in the chat and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So our first presenter is Greg Nostrud president of the Society for the Preservation of the Mooseman Armory, Inc., and Mooseman Town Councillor. And Greg is going to tell us how new life has been given to a historic building that's well over 100 years old. So, Greg, if you want to turn on your camera and mic and just give me a moment to queue up your slideshow, I will turn the proceedings over to you. Okay, Marvin. There you, you go, Greg. Hear me? Yep. Good, perfect. I am Greg Nostrud. Marvin uh, uh, gave a nice introduction there. I would like to uh, say thanks for inviting me into this uh, webinar and being, giving me an opportunity to uh, to talk about our uh, our project. Anyway, uh, getting started. Uh, I'm the president of the Pre Preservation of the Mooseman Army Society Inc. Uh, this building that you're looking at there is a is a memorial to a monument of a sacred place. That's how we look at this building. And it was uh, during the early parts of the 19th uh, century, Europe was in turmoil and it seemed that the British Empire and its colonies needed to arm themselves for a great war. Our area is no, was no exception. In 1912, Claude Manners began to construct this building on behalf of the British Empire. The completion of the building was in 1913 and it's immediate and it was immediately pressed into service. Local farm boys began to enlist and started their training. At the time, it disappeared to be a great adventure and the young boys, for these young boys starting their lives. They soon would come to, to the harsh reality of the war and ultimate, that ultimately took them from us. The photo on the scene is the 16th degree, the, the dead grooms, <laughs> they were the first to call the army home. During the First uh, World War, the 10th uh, Canadian Mounted uh, Rifles, the 217th Infantry Battalion, Canadian <coughs> Expeditionary Force, uh, and the 101st Battery Canadian Field Artil Artillery were also uh, recruited here. That's just a bit of a scripted thing there. Sorry, I kind of stumbled along there. But uh, when uh, there's a bit of a lesson to be kind of learned 
about buildings uh, of these types of uh, uh, historic value and, and uh, just the, uh, if you were to take a trip through Mooseman and you drive down where this armory is, there's no other buildings like this around there. They're, they're all modern bungalow type houses and stuff like that. A lot of the century old houses are all been taken down. So this, this brick building kind of just stands out there. But, uh, but when we were looking at it at the very beginning, it was in really uh, dire shape in regards to uh, 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 basically the brickwork was crumbling apart, uh, lightning strikes had uh, done their toll, uh, windows were, uh, were uh, covered over, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, uh, we had heard that the building was, uh, was uh, just about ready to, uh, uh, there had been an engineering study done by the town and they were saying that the building was uh, getting to that point where it, uh, it was getting dangerous. So uh, the town decided to put the building up for uh, for sale, and uh, we were a little concerned that, uh, as a group of uh, concerned citizens, that who would buy it and what they might do with it. So we we decided to form this organization and and so that we could we could guarantee that this building will not get in this same position ever again. And so uh, from there, that's how we got started. We uh, lobbied the town. Uh, we we made our presentation to them to show you know what is exactly we had in mind for it. The town accepted our uh, our proposal and allowed us to purchase the building. And then we began our um, our uh, our quest. Anyway, next slide. Uh, I think this, yeah. Okay, now uh, these are. I want to impress upon everybody. Like Mooseman is a is a is a historic town. It has a lot of really wonderful history, but one of the most important things is our early history and our connection with military. And you'll notice a lot of important people up on on uh, in these pictures. But there's there's many many more. We had five generals uh, uh, that come from Mooseman. Uh, most notably is uh, General Andrew McNaughton. Uh, he, uh, uh, pretty well everybody is probably watching this, this, this screen here knows who he is there. There's Sharp there, and there's uh, Chestnut, and Harry Mullen, and, and uh, Claude Manners, there's, and the list goes on. But uh, uh, er, early in Mooseman's history, uh, we, we had uh, not only a, a good talent on the top end, but we had a lot of soldiers that uh, came, uh, came to uh, Come now. This here is uh, uh, one of the reasons why we like to call this uh, 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 a uh, sacred place. If you take a look, you'll see names scratched in the bricks. This isn't just a, a little spot and just here. It's 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 all over the building, graffiti. But most of it is is uh, uh, soldiers and their uh, and dog tag numbers or uh, their numbers. And uh, like I say, it's. Pretty well all over the building, so we we don't like to uh, bring too much attention to that because we're worried that other you know people would come along and graffiti over top of this stuff here. But it gives you an idea of that of because uh, a lot of these names didn't come back. They they put their name on that brick and then they marched down to the railways and off to where they went or off to other places to train. But that was it for for their home. That was the last thing they did, and uh, and it. it uh, it's it's kind of it, it can't overemphasize the, the importance of those bricks and where they are located in the building and so on and so forth. So anyway, next slide. Now this is kind of how the building looked when we uh, when we just before we took over. And if you notice, there's uh, the windows windows are all covered in with plywood. And if you take a look, the finial on the top there is, and part of that chimney was blown off by lightning. Uh, the um, the the bricks, the pointing was uh, there was some some attempts to kind of fix on on the pointing, but it was done incorrectly. And we uh, talked with uh, with engineers, and they came and did an, ass an assessment. This is after the original engineers had, had done it, and uh, they said there's some hope as long as we kind of took certain steps. So that's when we uh, began to. Uh, to look over the uh, the problems, and 
I always uh, say when you're looking at a building, you look at the foundation and you kind of work your way up, you know, as, as to whether it's salvageable and, that, and that's what we did. And we were satisfied with the foundation, but we were a little concerned about the brick, but most of the, the problems, yes, there's a good example of, um, of kind of what we had to deal with. And I think uh, at that moment there, uh, what had happened is this is the, the repair was began and he took and chinked out uh, the, the old bad mortar that was put in there as a as a repair because there's there is there is something to the the science of that so he uh, he took it out and put in a softer mortar and uh, that was uh, how we were able to repair that so moving to the next slide okay now here's an example of getting a little ahead of ourselves um, if you look on the uh, on the top roof of the original building, you'll see the uh, um, um, the, the metal, and that metal was uh, uh, galvanized, but it had formed little uh, holes all over the place, and so water was starting to leak into the uh, building all over. And so our first attempt to, to, to do the repair was going up there and just simply tarring over the bad spots. But as you can see on the lean-to, we uh, we uh, put a, a, a new shingle, uh, new shingles on there because the old shingles were all cupped and curled, and and we didn't want any rain, more rain getting inside the building and causing damage to the uh, to the structure on the inside. So we re-shingled that part. Now there's an important lesson here about getting ahead of yourself and, and getting your uh, your priorities in the right list. So next slide. You'll see <laughs> now we've reached. Uh, uh, tin the roof and we chose uh, that particular uh, uh, tin as being the closest to the original as we possibly can because you can't get that original but you'll also notice on the lean to we got tin on there too so that beautiful roof that we just finished shingling <laughs> we covered it over with tin when we came to uh, to that part which I think was just a year apart from from so that, that, that original uh, lean to roof was only uh, a year old and we were covering it already uh, but as you can see uh, we picked that red I think that was uh, the same red that uh, the armies in Brandon had and uh, we just looked at something that because uh, there really was no because the original roof was not uh, the roof before this was not the original roof. there was a we believe it was a copper roof before that and, and I'm not sure just exactly why the change over happened but we do know from evidence when we were taking that roof off that there had been a, another roof uh, uh, decking or whatever on top of that. But before we, uh, we put that uh, a tin up there, we put six inch styrofoam underneath there. And there's a reason for that, which I'll explain on the later slide. Next. Okay, this is the inside of the building. And uh, you'll notice uh, the uh, plywood has been removed on the, the one wall and we uh, we had to cut the uh, the gyp rock and that that um, that uh, sound barrier insu insulation out of, to expose the windows and, and an example of what it looked like before is if you were to look at the end of the hall there you'll just see it's it's blank well that's what these windows look like before we cut them open and then we added the uh, the, the styles uh, uh, the uh, the trim onto the windows, but that was just a choice of ours. We didn't follow, there was, because originally the inside of the brick or the building would be just brick and it would be just brick around those windows. So anyway, you'll notice a drop ceiling there, that had a goal. It, uh, it was just uh, put up there and insulation sat on top. There was no vapor barriers. So we had condensation and dripping going on all the time there. So the next slide, we'll show you, there you are exactly what was going on above that, that ceiling and, and why we were doing the things we we're doing. Beautiful, beautiful uh, um, uh, beam, uh, beams and, and trusses up there, post and beam, I'm not sure exactly what you call that, but there's other examples in Moosman that we have a United Church that has the exact same uh, uh, roof structure going on there. And you'll see now why we put the styrofoam on the top of, of the decking that's not that's not styrofoam. That's uh, that's two by, I believe it's uh, two by uh, six uh, uh, pine that's been sat on top there, and then the, the styrofoam sits on top of that, and then the, the siding. 
but uh, you, you can see those, the bottoms of the beams, how they're, they're showing there. And the, the very last one, we are, we are beginning to cover that with uh, the drywall, to because that that what you're going to see. And the reason why we had to do that is those back windows were higher than the uh, than the ones on the side, so we needed to raise the ceiling up a foot and a half to uh, be able to uh, fully expose those windows. And you'll see that, I believe, in the next slide. Next, yeah, there you are. Now you can see why we raised the ceiling, because like I say, those nice, beautiful arch windows on the end there now are fully exposed. Now we, we have something happening here and unexpected uh, dividends with uh, the fact we opened up all this because we were looking for cosmetic, you know, we wanted to kind of you know, return it back, but uh, we found out that uh, our heating bills went down in the winter time because of the, the when they were designing this, the way that the windows are set up there, it just was just a natural way for 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 light to come in and to heat. And also during the day, of course, we don't have to run our lights. We got plenty of light covered in from there, so we're quite happy. We're happy at the uh, the way the the the, the rafters, the bottoms of them show there. It looks you know very uh, solid and and also. Again, unexpected uh, dividend was the uh, fact that it improved our sound uh, acoustically. It, it actually uh, helped to ba baffle the sound a bit there. So, and uh, this is a really good example of, of another reason why we wanted to salvage this building is that beautiful uh, maple hardwood floor. It um, it uh, it's it's uh, it's quite famous around the area to the dancing groups and stuff like that because they love to come and dance on that floor. And uh, again, it's the same age as the building. And you'll notice just down on the top, or sorry, the bottom uh, right-hand side, you'll see remnants of, of, of an old wall. And uh, when they're doing drill and stuff like that, the drill sergeant Matt would be standing on a balcony above uh, that, where that we see the, the working floor. And there was a balcony up there and he would be barking his orders, I guess, at the men down below. They used to bring in Jeeps to do uh, um, uh, work on the Jeeps. And also uh, um, they uh, bring in artillery guns and stuff like that. And the middle of the floor underneath is supported by a big slab of concrete. And they used to do drills and things like that around heavy artillery uh, guns and stuff like that as well in there, as well as the drills. And if there was uh, the, uh, uh, no, uh, next slide, yeah, move to the next slide. Oh yeah. Moving forward, we we wanted to get rid of all the the, the kinks and that. And one of the first things we noticed is that th that room was filled with an old boiler. I it was uh, um, a great big huge iron uh, uh, monstrosity in there. But we we were always worried about it going and 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 going fritz, and then we'd have to uh, uh, panic trying to get something else in there. You know, so we always planned. Kind of a step ahead for problems now, and this is what we came up with the with the with the boiler plan, and this is the the new boiler system that we put in there, and it's uh, it's uh, it I understand it to be operating at a very high efficiency somewhere in the 98 where we were working before at about 65, and in boilers that's quite a difference, so cost savings and and uh, again uh, through. Uh, uh, different sorts of uh, fundraising and, and uh, grants and stuff like that, we're able to achieve this. And I'll explain that a little bit later too as well. The next slide. This is the kitchen. And we uh, we took an old, uh, like they say, a, a, a pig's nose, and, or made a silk purse out of a pig's nose or whatever. <laughs> anyway, it, uh, it was, the kitchen looked pretty beat up in that, and, and this is what we came up. Uh, we put in brand new cupboards in the center and new countertops. Uh, we, as you can see, we we, uh, uh, we have uh, coolers in there, uh, stoves, everything like that, because again, when we uh, got the building, none of that was there. They, they Everything was stripped out of it, so we had to kind of come from the ground up. And so this is what we came up with the kitchen plan, keeping in, uh, in mind that, you know, food services and stuff like that. We have the six sinks, all that sort of stuff. So we we, uh, we made sure before we made moves that we're following and complying to all the building codes, et cetera. Next slide. Bathrooms, of course, when we inherited the building, the bathrooms are terrible, terrible, terrible shape. Floors were peeling up and, and, and uh, 
Yes, uh, you can only imagine. So this is what we came up with in the men's bathroom as a uh, as a renovation. We're very happy with uh, with the results, clean, um, and uh, and uh, again uh, paying attention to certain uh, codes and stuff like that for the handicap. We kind of take in consideration wind up widening up uh, enter or openings and stuff like that so you can get in there. Um, next slide. This was an important thing, again, keeping in mind public safety and stuff like that, and that we are custodians of this building. We want to rent it to people. We want it to be safe. So uh, as you can see, this is the same picture, the same opening, but it, we widened it out. And that was the only thing we had to do to the building structurally that uh, that kind of you know took away from a bit of the historic thing there. But we, we needed to make that entrance safer because it was a bottleneck and you can imagine what can happen if there was a, a situation, stuff like that, the bottleneck like that. We're lucky over all the years that we didn't have anything, but we widened it out. And, and also, if you take a look at the brickwork, we paid attention that the, the, the master brick worker working there built the same sort of a lantel that you see on the smaller door over top of the bigger opening. And he, 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 he uh, distributed the force down in that. He, he put in, uh, uh, iron uh, uh, reinforcement, uh, angle iron, up in there as well. Like he went and took a lot of consideration in, into what he was doing in, in widening up that opening. Another thing I should mention, <clears throat> that's this door in the back, like this is standing in that opening now, looking further on into the uh, foyer out to the, uh, the street. There used to be a smaller door, or sorry, there was two doors in there fitting into that opening, but uh, they're only like about uh, 28 inches or whatever with a bar in the middle, like going from the ground to the ceiling for the two doors. And uh, it uh, was old panic hardware. It was, it again, another really concern. So we put a four foot door in there with proper pan, uh, panic hardware in that, uh, to make that much more, uh, a, a better way to, uh, to get in and out of the building. You'll notice that we, we put all the safety lights and we've got uh, the uh, you know exit signs and everything like that as well, paying, paying attention to, again to codes and stuff like that. This is, uh, this is the results of what our hard work, as you can see the finial on the top is now in place. Brickwork is all repointed and done. Windows are all open and painted. An interesting thing about those windows, um, <laughs> the, uh, the <laughs> The windows on the uh, on the end, those three ones with the arch on top there, we had to rebuild those. And we we really searched around trying to find um, somebody that could do that. So we were in Regina and we talked to, uh, I think it was uh, Regina Adores and Sash or something like that. But uh, um, the uh, the cost was going to be uh, out, out of this world here. And, and so we started to look around and and somebody who's thinking outside the box says, hey, I know somebody that might be able to build those windows. And so we got in touch with him. And as it turns out, he had all the right tools and everything like that to build that. But he also worked out at the potash mine. And the potash mine has a really neat program when their employees donate time and work and stuff like that, they'll double it. So we were sitting there looking at what was potentially going to cost us a lot of money and, and you know, spending you know, down our reserves and stuff like that to get those windows done to, uh, to a situation that perhaps there might be a way to turn us into a fundraiser. So in the end, what happened is that this fellow donated his time to build those, those, those windows and the mine kicked in uh, exactly doubled that. And so we actually made money rather than spending money. So just a little, you know, thinking outside the box. Uh, very, very proud of the building. It, it, it's, this is uh, getting down to the end of my presentation. This is the gala that we had in 2013. As you can see, the windows weren't cut out yet or anything like that, but uh, we're able to attract uh, a, a lot of uh, important people. Uh, you'll notice uh, the previous prime minister, uh, Brad Wall is in there in that picture. There's uh, uh, General Andrew Leslie in there. And, and uh, some other uh, majors and generals were in there. There was, uh, uh, you can see the Grand March going on. It, uh, in, a, in a building, like I think we're able to facilitate on that gala 160 people. And you can see the Royal, the military band playing in the background. Wonderful time. And, uh, and uh, 
we really got a lot of uh, encouragement from the premier and, and different other people, the lieutenant governor there um, as well. And uh, they were really uh, behind us. It, it really helped us uh, uh, move forward knowing that we're doing the right thing. Next slide. This is just uh, you. You may wonder. Okay, now we've got the building all all up to snuff. How do we how do we maintain things? And and it's through these these different uh, venues. Like uh, we have um, uh, uh, we, we we a lot of our money came from grants that we we're able to secure. One of them being with the the uh, uh, branch. I'm just going to see if I got this written. Oh yeah, donation. Yeah. From the Saskatchewan Heritage Foundation, the town uh, des designated the, the armories as a municipal property in, in 2011, making it us eligible to apply for foundation grants, which we, we do. And we have a sign out that, that at the one side there, it's not in this picture, but it does talk about that. We also got grants, uh, including New Horizons and the FCC grants, um, Farm Corporation credit or something like that. And, and through the years, we've had received several sizable donations from companies and other, uh, don and other personal donations, mainly for Nutrium, they're one of the biggest contributors. As these, uh, yeah, and also along with these donations, uh, and we got uh, cash donations, but we also got uh, uh, items and stuff like that, because every year we hold a, uh, a big auction and uh, people that the community they wait for auctions to bring in and we get flooded with all sorts of stuff to, to sell and that so we have a really successful once a year auctions and and uh, so as far as in-house stuff we try not to step on the you know the, the, the community clubs toes by by you know uh, competing with them but we do allow them they come to the building they rent it and they they hold their functions and uh, i believe that Winds up with the slide for presentation, right, Martin? That's the last slide. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will conclude by by thanking Martin for 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 putting this together. Uh, he's been behind us uh, uh, when we first met him oh, 16, 15, 16 years ago. He came and he presented uh, to us a, 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 an opportunity to to look at our main street. And uh, who knew that it was going to uh, turn into this? So thanks, Marvin, for uh, for coming and helping. Well, thank you, Greg, for being with us today. I mean, it's, it's so great to see that a building that is so important to Mooseman's military heritage is, is still a living part of the community and, and will be for a long time to come, thanks to the efforts of your organization and all of the people in the community who supported the project. So Greg has said he can stay till the end of the hour. Or, and uh, so if anyone has any questions, please hold them until then. And or put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them and we'll get to our next presenter right away here. It's James Yoke, principal and architect at P3 Architecture. He was the principal in charge of design for Dark Hall and for the College and Connexus buildings and his interest in the history of art and architecture and the built environment really was an invaluable component of the College Avenue campus renewal. So James, I'll just turn it over to you to tell us about the award-winning revitalization of, of Dark Hall. Thanks, Marvin. Uh, Marvin, you can maybe give me a thumbs up if you can, uh, or Marvin, uh, that yeah. you can hear me. Yeah, James can hear Good. you and see your slide. Great. OK, uh, I've got a lot of slides to go through, so I'll, I'll be going fairly quickly here. Um, I always like to talk a little bit about the uh, context that, that these heritage buildings were were originally built in. Um, and at the, the end of the, the 19th century, there was a, a, a very um, profound uh, reaction to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, medievalism, med medievalism, particularly in the United Kingdom and the colonies, became a preferred aesthetic, uh, and that was in stark contrast to, to neoclassical uh, architecture. Um, the neo, the, the neo-Gothic was seen as more authentic, and it was a return to a more folksy paradigm. Um, so we, we have to remember that this is the type of thing that is happening uh, while uh, pro the project at, at College Avenue campus would have been beginning. So um, 
we see that uh, the architecture, the neo-Gothic uh, embodied in the, the bottom photo here, you can see the uh, St. Pancras Hotel in London, which is from about 1870. And we hold that in, in contrast to um, how neoclassical architecture was held out as uh, more of an expression of colonial power, uh, particularly in places like New Delhi and very famously Washington DC. So of course what happens in the, at the mothership happens in, in Canada uh, and we can see with our own parliament buildings how that Gothic expression makes its way to uh, North America. Um, we are not alone as a, as a colony. Uh, this was also happening in the United States where uh, locations like this, the, the Yale University Harkness Tower uh, or the University of Tennessee Ayers Hall, uh, which looks very much like College Avenue campus, were, were uh, exemplifying the collegiate Gothic movement that was occurring. And the collegiate Gothic, of course, was drawing inspiration from Oxford and Cam Cambridge University. Uh, and here you see King's College and this idea of the crenellated um, architecture, uh, the um, uh, pointed windows uh, and the courtyard type of expression was uh, was sort of deemed to be the pinnacle of um, collegiate or, or academic architecture. Um, and then when we start to look more locally, we think about Regina and the original Moss and Plan, uh, how the City Beautiful movement was manifesting itself around uh, around the world. Um, and you can imagine Regina with grand uh, diagonal boulevard similar to Washington DC. You can see the um, train station in the middle. You see Wascana Park. Uh, you see the exhibition grounds. Um, you see the crescents uh, in this area. Um, of course, not all of this was was completed or the crescents, I'm sorry, in this area uh, over here. There was actually a train station that terminated where the uh, old Sastel building is on Albert College and College Avenue at the north edge of, of the can of uh, Wascana Lake. Um, I could, we could talk for an hour about the Mawson plan. But embedded within that Moss and Plan was a concept for the, the University of Regina, of course not known as that at the time, but this College Avenue campus, uh, of which the only building that was built was the college building, which you see in the center of the of the collection here with the lake to the south. Um, the connection to the courtyard, and you see how uh, collegiate Gothic this is with its uh, colonnaded uh, walkways, its series of courtyards, its port cochiers that connect uh, the college, the public side to the more um, academic side. Um, so what, it, what ends up happening out at College Avenue is the uh, construction originally of the college building which included the the tower which was a little bit later addition and this was uh, done pre-war, uh, pre-World War I. Um, a little bit later on uh, during the course of the war uh, starting at about 1916 you see the girls dormitory building what became known as the conservatory building uh, being constructed um, and that was actually a, a Punton design and I'll talk a little bit about Punton in a moment uh, as he was the architect on on Dark Hall as well uh, but you see how um, the impact of the war on the economics uh, of the, the community started to, to affect uh, the architecture that the girls dormitory building is a four story building. The college building is a three story building and you can see the change in scale. Um, which was uh, which quite interesting. When we worked on the college building, I won't dwell on it today, but we found that uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I really love the comment uh, uh, from the previous presentation about you look at the foundations and you work your way up. Unfortunately, uh, again, as a cost savings, I expect that the foundations were built very cheaply and very shallow. Uh, and considering it was built on a floodplain next to the creek, um, unfortunately the, the girls dormitory building could not be saved and it was in fact at risk of pulling the entire uh, uh, tower down with it. Uh, so we retained the facade. Um, presentation on that project is, a, is another hour uh, presentation. We know that Dark Hall of course was um, a, a passion project of, of Frank Dark. Uh, the project was completely funded through private donations. Uh, here it is under construction in, the, in 1928. Uh, pool construction, uh, the forebearer to PCL construction. We're building and I love the photo because you could see uh, OHS was a little bit different at the time. 
Uh, the architect uh, for the original building was James Henry Punton. Uh, he was a well-known architect. Uh, you can see highlighted here. He did Regina Methodist College, Luther College, um, uh, and he very much drew inspiration for his designs from Oxford and Cambridge. And you see one of the original um, cross section through Dark Hall in this image. Uh, the project or the building was added to in the 1960s by uh, the late Clifford Weens, well-known Regina architect, uh, and it was quite a beautiful interpretation at the at the rear of the building. And I find it interesting because the building um, addition very much takes on uh, many of the the qualities uh, that we look for in an addition now when we follow uh, heritage restoration and addition guidelines. And that's that the architecture is is distinct from the original. It's subservient um, and, and it's something that could be removed in the future if it ever needed to be. Uh, I won't go into the details of that. I just bounce off the surface. So our analysis of College Avenue campus was, was extremely extensive. Um, our team looked at uh, things like view corridors, uh, the original uh, intent for the circulation through Port Cochiers, uh, and how we could perhaps bring back some of this feeling of uh, the Gothic and the original intent, and that was through creation of uh, courtyard and usable exterior public space. Um, the Conexus building uh, and Conexus's contribution to the project really made the Dark Hall project possible, but this image starts to show how the layout of the buildings start to create these courtyards. Uh, we reintroduce sort of a feeling of the courtyard at the back of the College Avenue campus, um, and we're actually using this amenity link, this new lobby for Dark Hall funded by the Conexus project as our main entrance to uh, the renovated Dark Hall. Um, an analysis uh, in a 3D uh, model uh, looks like this, and you can see the series of uh, the addition, the West addition on the college building, Dark Hall, and the relationship of the Conexus building to the um, uh, College Avenue campus. Um, again, the building, the new building is distinct um, from the original Gothic architecture uh, or neo-Gothic architecture, but you can see how it's subservient. We've, um, if you drew a, a line in perspective from the top of the towers on Dark Hall, uh, we align with that. The size of the window slots that you see on the north side are actually derived from the width of the slots of the windows on Dark Hall. Um, so we're repeating that rhythm. The size of the opening in the glass where the entrance is, is the width of one of these openings. So it's sympathetic. Uh, and then the dark hall entrance, and I'll talk about why it is the way it is in a moment. Um, the the backlit uh, sign acts like a interpretation of a marquee and indicates the main entrance to the building. And it is the main entrance to the building, largely um, because of accessibility issues and trying to create a ramp at the front of this heritage building would have destroyed the um, the architecture of it. So we end up with a new lobby that's able to accommodate uh, both events and pre-show uh, folks. Um, you can see that uh, the intent of the addition uh, was to respect the height of the original windows and to be as gentle a touch to the existing building as we possibly could. Um, you can see the ground level on the right hand side here. Uh, so you would actually come up from ground to the event level, to the auditorium level, but ground level on the south side as it falls to the lake is actually at the same ground level as uh, what was the former basement. So the clever uh, approach here was to use that ground level as our accessible entrance uh, where you could enter uh, via a gentle ramp at the front or from ground level uh, on the south side uh, and then make your way up through the building. Uh, a new elevator was added in one of the stair, one of the former towers, not stair tower, in one of the former towers to allow access to balcony, auditorium and ground level. And then a lift system was built, um, what would be essentially back of house, which is the blue area, to allow access to the very various dressing room and stage levels. Um, I don't know what it was about the 60s and 70s, but they loved their split levels. Uh, and when Cliff Weens did an addition off the back, he introduced even more levels to the building. So altogether, I think if you count them, there's seven or eight different levels changes that we had to accommodate to make the building inclusive uh, for both patrons and um, uh, performers. 
the exterior of the building was completely uh, restored. The bricks were repointed. Uh, extensive research into the lime mortar uh, was was uh, under under undertaken. The um, roofing was all redone. The slate shingles, the uh, original slate shingles were all removed, cataloged, uh, new flashings, new modern roofing applied, and then the original slate roofing was reapplied to the, the building. So an uh, extensive exterior restoration with uh, stonework was repaired. Uh, there's the front of the existing building or the building uh, in its pre uh, restored state. And there it is in its finished state with all of the stone cleaned. Um, the doors and all of the woodwork uh, and windows were all restored uh, from their original state. And a new set of stairs was introduced at the front in black granite. Um, and this makes the originally you would step out the doors and there was a step immediately at the door, uh, which was an extremely dangerous situation. So we recreated that front entrance uh, and made it a little bit more uh, friendly with the idea that it, it can be opened and used um, either for entrance, but more likely for exiting from the building after a show. Uh, and there you have the, the finished product uh, from the exterior. To give you a sense of the amount of work that went into it, it was a brand new mechanical and electrical system and significant structural intervention to be able to carry these systems within the building. Uh, it's difficult to see, but the, the green is the um, electrical, the blue is the mechanical, and the red is the structural that all had to be inserted and hidden within the building. Uh, acoustics were critical. We had an acoustic engineer that, uh, with a worldwide reputation that came in, analyzed the building. Um, uh, people like to think that Dark Hall was a great acoustic space. Um, it was good, but it wasn't great. Um, the interventions that were undertaken by our team uh, have created uh, an even better space. Um, part of that analysis uh, led to a pattern of um, sound diffusing elements that we needed to introduce to the walls. I'll talk about that in a moment. So here's what the old basement used to look like, very much like any church basement you would see uh, in a, any any church across, or any hall across uh, across North America, I think um, that was converted to our new public amenity space, our entry lobby, our crush space, and of course the bar and washrooms. So uh, that's the the final product. Um, you can see the curtain in the background here, which covers the coat check and office space for dark hall with uh, large accessible washrooms able to accommodate the entirety of the um, uh, auditorium uh, at a short intermission uh, were introduced. Uh, you now come into the building at the lower level and you make your way up the stairs or up the elevator to the uh, event level. Uh, that meant that an old storage room uh, was removed and a new set of stairs to match the existing was extended down to the lower level, giving us flanking stairs on either side. Um, and those stairs were very carefully uh, designed to match the existing uh, that were on the opposite side. So this is a view looking in what is the entry lobby off to your left where the bar is, and I'm standing in front of the um, where the washrooms used to be in old dark hall, if you were there, uh, towards the new staircase. Uh, on the second floor, uh, there was a famous uh, office space. Um, that office space used by one of the conservatory, uh, one of the professors at the U of R, uh, was converted uh, through the process into a lo uh, lobby for uh, use by uh, balcony patrons. The restoration work that was uh, undertaken also included the Cliff Weens edition. Um, and you can see here in this slide the uh, how the uh, the lights, the flying saucer lights were retained. Um, the furniture that was selected for the space, this is the green room, uh, is all sort of has a, a late century modern feel to it. Uh, the masonry was all cleaned up uh, and the existing structures were, were all repainted and freshened. Um, uh, all of the um, um, back of house spaces uh, were made handicap accessible uh, with new dressing room layouts and accessible washrooms, along with our washrooms on the main floor, which you see on the bottom right. Um, one of the more interesting things that was uncovered uh, through this process um, was uh, revealed, <laughs> revealed through uh, looking at old photographs. And, and I, I don't offhand know who this uh, very dapper gentleman is. Um, this photo was taken from the existing stairwell and you can see across the hall there is no stairwell. Uh, 
um, going up to the second or down to the third uh, or down to the lower level. Um, the elevator lobby, by the way, that we've created is actually in the tower behind the uh, the wall right here. But one of the things that we uncovered was just as there are three entrance doors uh, from the exterior, there were, were originally three archways coming into the auditorium. At some point in time, that center arch disappeared and was covered up. Um, we modeled what it might look like if we were to uh, uncover and find that original uh, set of doors. Um, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depends on how you look at it, um, when our contractor, Leadcore Construction, cut through the wall, they found that the wall had been infilled. There were no existing doors uh, or, or millwork, uh, woodwork existing, unfortunately, but the archway uh, was pretty pristine. So what we uh, decided to do was uh, open that back up um, and restore it uh, in the same way that the exterior doors had been restored. And you can see the new doors with the stained glass, uh, leaded glass going in here. Um, you can see the new staircase has been installed on the right hand side. Uh, and you can see that they're starting to get the base work done on the painting for the, uh, the gold paint. Um, and there's the finished product. Uh, so you would never know that this set of doors um, wasn't an original set of doors that had been restored. Even the, all of the hardware was uh, was sourced to match the existing and, and refurbished. What that allowed us to do was to create a new light and sound lock, um, which is located underneath the balcony. So you're now provided some um, separation as you enter the auditorium from the actual performance space. Uh, I have a picture of it under construction. Um, this allowed us to put a handicap accessible ramp uh, and increase accessibility to the auditorium floor. Um, so it was not just a sound and light lock, but it was part of that uh, way of integrating universal accessibility and inclusivity into the original architecture of the building. Um, and there it is approaching completion. The auditorium floor itself was an interesting challenge. Um, the original floor was not raked, it was not sloped, it was flat. Uh, and then in a subsequent renovation, uh, a sloped floor, floor was introduced. That sloped floor actually ran uh, at an angle that was not parallel or that was exactly um, parallel to the stage and perpendicular to the exterior walls, which meant if you were sitting at the front, you would be looking at the exit stairs and not at the stage. So uh, that was removed and a new seating bowl uh, that is actually a bowl shape where every seat is facing the stage uh, was created. It was a really a, a, a technical and construction uh, miracle that they were able to do it. Uh, the original stage uh, did not have a, a proscenium it, or a projection. It, it did not come past the proscenium arch. Um, so that was rebuilt uh, and uh, it increased our stage size, allowing for the uh, use of the uh, stage by larger ensembles. The original ceiling was uh, stripped back down. Every place you see it in brown, the um, uh, old asbestos acoustic tiles were peeled off. You could see um, how the original ceiling had, had a bunch of holes cut in it for ventilation. Uh, much of that was all uh, peeled back uh, and uh, new mechanical and electrical were installed. I talked about the um, uh, treatment, the acoustic treatment and the, uh, the little green uh, shapes. Well, what we decided to do was in order to improve the acoustics in the space and integrate it into the architecture, we created a wainscoting. So if you've been in the building, you've seen this, this beautiful woodwork that runs along the wall that acts as a datum line. Um, and we decided through a mock-up that the way to approach this would be to use it for three things. One is the acoustics, which you, you see as a sort of this washboard finish on the woodwork in this mock-up. We decided to use it as an indirect light to provide lighting to the architecture and illuminate the walls in a very dramatic way. And then the third thing we decided to do was to embed our heating coils uh, for the radiant heating within that panel system so that you didn't have ugly radiators up against the perimeter wall and it was all integrated into what I, I would consider a very beautiful solution. One of the other really interesting things that we uncovered were the famous windows. And these windows had had and the entire space really had undergone what I call a renovation to beige. 
Um, and at some point in time, the walls were painted beige, the trim was all painted beige, um, and a lot of the, the, the stuff was covered up. The woodwork was covered up by these blackout windows or blackout blinds, uh, curtains that had been added. Um, and we really looked for solutions that would allow us to uh, restore these windows. As part of the process, this is actually one of our architecture students up on a ladder with the, with some paint thinner. Um, we knew through old photographs that there was uh, accent paints in the space um, and we set about exploring what those might look like. So she's looking at an archway here and some of the trim, but around the windows was this incredible stenciling that we could see in, in the old images. We couldn't quite tell the color. So she stripped the paint back for us and we uncovered what this stencil looked like. We then created a model for what the uh, stenciling and the gold paint uh, would look like in the space, uh, partially to um, get people excited about, about what the future dark hall might look like, um, and then set about uh, creating a new stencil that mimicked what was originally there. And understand every single window is different because it's all hand done plaster. So we measured every single window. We actually used a 3D scanner, which scanned within a millimeter of, uh, of distance. So we were able to get a precise reading as to the size of each window. We created a stencil in um, electronic drawing format that was then put in a machine and computer cut specific to each window. Um, and then we tried to match the blue paint that was uh, found on the original um, fake organ piping that was in the space. And you can see the matching of the paint here. And the result, and you can see the windows in various states uh, of uh, work. You can see the stenciling uh, underway. You can see a finished product here. And you can see the restored woodwork and lead glass as well that was undertaken. Uh, you can see a gentleman here doing some paint work uh, off of what we call the dance floor scaffolding uh, for uh, the archways uh, and these uh, column pilasters that we're projecting between each of the windows. Uh, every bit of the painting was, was restored in the building. You can see the original um, organ pipes, which are not organ pipes, they're actually fake, uh, but they perform an important, important acoustic feature uh, in the space were, were also restored. Um, the undertaking uh, was months and months of, of time. Uh, it required the construction of what we call a dance floor. And you can see it in this panoramic from end to end in, ordering, in order for the contractors to be able to access the entire uh, space. Um, don't know why I've got an exterior photo there. I'll move on. Um, even pieces like the light fixtures were examined. Um, the original light fixtures seen here on the left uh, from an old photograph and you could see the original columns or the original arches. Uh, back in the 80s, there was a renovation done and a light that uh, was perhaps better suited for a um, sanctuary in a church was, was installed in the space. Uh, we researched uh, light fixtures or light, um, lights that we could use that would resemble the existing light fixtures and we found uh, the particular lens on the right and that was what was installed. So uh, here's a picture of the auditorium with the flat floor, the balcony. Um, you can see that there are no pipes up top here. Uh, you can see the original light fixtures. You could see what it looked like when they introduced the raked floor with the wardrobes that were at the back of the hall, um, the very thin old seats. You can see kind of the shape that they were in, um, the curtains and things like that and what it looked like pre-renovation. Um, this is looking towards the stage. Uh, so you can see that there is really no projection, but you can see the architecture and expression on the front of this stage and what the shape of the curtains look like. And then you look at it uh, pre-renovation again, um, access to the stage uh, from front of house was this um, temporary set of stairs. You see sort of this black element that doesn't have any relationship to the rest of the space uh, installed and, and a different type of, um, of curtaining. So we did a analysis of, uh, this is actually a 3D rendering of what the final product would look like. Um, we looked at different options for how we might introduce that new stage extension. And this is actually a black and white photograph uh, that has been cut and pasted in from the uh, back in the 1930s. And then the finished product. So you can see we've reintroduced the um, 
existing or the, the original curtaining look. Uh, we've used the same uh, walnut stained wood trim that was found throughout the building as the front of our new stage. The seating has all been completely redone and made accessible. Um, all the seating areas have accessible seating uh, areas in them uh, and they all meet the current uh, codes and requirements. Uh, within the space, you see the, the new lights that have gone in that resemble the original, and you can also see the um, how uh, the modern accoutrement for a theater have been introduced but hidden within the architecture. This is actually powered, this, this light bar, uh, the rigging, it lowers to the floor for access and can be raised back up electronically so that nobody's in there with ladders. Uh, hidden within the window frames is a powered blind. You can just see the triangle of it here. Uh, this has a little string that comes up to a little motor, and this can be lifted up and becomes the blackout blind for the for the space. So we don't have any more of those those red curtains blocking the beautiful woodwork uh, and all of the stenciling. And that was an but an hour presentation in 30 minutes. I apologize for the sheer velocity of that. Well, it's a lot of information, but you didn't miss a beat there, uh, James. Uh, thank, thanks so much for that. And uh, just wow, what an amazing project and a, a world class facility for Regina. So certainly kudos to the university and your firm and and to Connexus and all the other supporters in the community who enabled it to happen. And thanks for sharing that with us. I've got to get down and buy a ticket for something. Yeah, I encourage everyone to to get in there for a show. It's uh, it's quite a space. Um, we're very proud of it. Uh, incredible team effort. Uh, yeah, and kudos to the university for uh, having the vision to bring it back to life the way that they have. And thanks for the opportunity to talk about it today, Marvin. It is a uh, it's a project that was near and dear to our our team's heart. Well, it was an absolute pleasure to hear about it. And while we are at the top of the, of the hour, I'm not sure uh, if James and Greg are able to stay with us for a, another minute or two in case there are questions. Uh, James is nodding yes. Yep. Um, I'll just check in the chat here. I know somebody had asked Greg if that lean-to was an original part of the uh, armory building. Greg, are you still lurking no, there? That leading to was not. It was built in the 60s. I think it was part of the Centennial Project, 67. And they put the, it was just the, the cinder block. And uh, uh, we we kind of again choosing paints and stuff like that. We tried to blend it in. We kind of uh, yeah. again a, a, a trick you had suggested to us, and, and we had uh, we come up with just a, so so it, it kind of makes you wonder, you know, first glance if it was part of it, but no, it wasn't. Okay, thanks, Greg. Yeah, if anybody else has any questions, uh, you can just use the uh, little hand icon on your screen to raise your hand and we'll call on you or put it in the chat uh, just while everyone's thinking about their possible questions. I'll ask James. I'm curious to know is the front original entrance to Dark Hall still functional? And if so, when or how might it be used? Yeah, it's it it absolutely is still uh, functional. The the in fact, it's been made more functional uh, with the work that was done. Um, the opportunity for use of the front doors is really on a case by case basis, depending on the show that's going on. Marvin, the um, uh, the intent is that that um, because it's accessible to go to the building uh, into the building through the lower level. Um, they use that as the main entrance into the building. Um, we would see that uh, those doors uh, can be used as an exit after the building in any instance. There's nothing to prevent people from exiting that way. Um, however, I would think that the university, if they have a ticketed event, um, would want to have somebody at those doors uh, checking tickets basically um, and then people would have the option to use both so really it's an operational thing for the university uh, but the doors are are absolutely usable okay and uh, I'm not seeing any other immediate questions here I will squeeze one more in for Greg if I could though I mean historic buildings have a bit of a bad rap for their energy performance. Greg, you mentioned some of the insulating and the new uh, heating equipment you put in there. As you, have you found that's made a big difference to the building's uh, energy consumption and the cost of running it? 
huge difference, huge, huge difference. We uh, we gone for something that was, uh, you know, we were wondering if we we're going to be able to sustain, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the building at, at its present form at that time. We were wondering if we were going to afford the, the energy bills and stuff like that going forward. And, but as we've been doing each improvement, it's, you know, the, rather than going up, our, our energy bills are dropping. So, yeah, no, it was, uh, you know, we, we paid, we paid a lot of attention to that because again, it's uh, uh, it's one thing to go and derive income and stuff like that off of people renting and stuff like that, but still, you, you kind of reach that that point. So yeah, it uh, it was a it was very very a very good move on our part. Okay, thanks, Greg. Uh, a couple more things coming in here for James. Uh, some questions we made of. Perhaps anticipated. Can you give a cost estimate for the hall restoration? Yeah, I, I was typing an answer, but I'm too slow. Um, <laughs> the the I think the final construction cost. I, I you know I should know this. I should have looked it up. I, it was sort of between 15 and and 18 million dollars, if if I recall. Um, which you know it's interesting because Massey Hall in Toronto was having a uh, major restoration done at the same time and uh, when we were looking at Dark Hall and we looked at the cost of the renovation per seat uh, versus what Massey Hall was spending per seat uh, the budget for Dark Hall was about a third of what Toronto was spending on Massey Hall so uh, it was a tremendous job i mean the timing was great uh the the, the market um, was able to take this project on at a very affordable level i think it would be a great challenge to do it today uh given our our construction market and and inflation and escalation but yeah it was in that 15 to 17. good timing in a sense to get it done when it was done then considering what the budget might look like in today's uh, market. Yeah, well, I think if it was if we were to start it and put it out for tender today, uh, it would be in the 25 to 27 million range. Significant. So, so Greg, uh, Vishit is wondering uh, when that gala at the Armory took place, what year was that? That was 2013. June, June of 2013. And and I was fortunate enough to have been invited to it and can say it's just really an amazing uh, evening and a real testament to the work all your group had done out there. And I think it served to really kind of raise the profile of the uh, of that building in the community as well, which would have had its benefits. Thank uh, you, Marla. See, I see out of balance. Uh, how to balance preservation with improvements? I guess either of you could comment on that. Uh, always a challenge when doing a heritage rehabilitation. Needing to make a building functional while still retaining its heritage character. Greg, do you want to answer how you folks well, approached it? Exactly that. It, it, we, we did not want to lose that uh, the, 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 the idea Again, like my opening sentence, I talked about a, a, this is a spiritual place, a, a place of, um, of um, you know, um, there, there's a type of honor, you know, with that building and, and with us moving forward, we couldn't change it. We, 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 we did everything we could to pay attention to every little detail. And uh, yes, uh, it, it's there's only one way to do it as far as I'm concerned when you work with a building like that and that's that's uh, from the from the ground up properly yeah, I would I would say that um, the way that that um, and, and I think this is what what Greg is probably getting at too um, our process was was perhaps um, a little bit more uh, documented through the process, uh, the design process, and that was looking at what are considered the heritage defining elements of the architecture in the building. Um, so the the stonework, the masonry work, the slate roof, uh, the the gold paint, the ar the archway or the 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 arched roof, the the stained glass windows, the the quality of the woodwork, and and these are um, 
defining elements within the architecture. Um, so we looked at those and said, OK, we want to bring these back to a level where they are uh, comparable to where they were as uh, at the original construction of the building. Um, and that includes the Cliff Weens uh, addition. Um, the basement was a was a tabula rasa. It was a blank slate for us, of course, but I, so I'm talking about really the event level, the auditorium level uh, and above. Um, and then you, you you have to take a look at, OK, now the building has to be operable from for the next 50 years. So what do we need to do to make this a functional facility uh, that meets all of the needs of a modern performance hall? from a patron and from a performer perspective. And then what impact does that have on the overall architecture? And how could we tie that into these uh, restoration efforts on the character defining elements? Um, and then you, it simply becomes a prioritization exercise. And then it's part of the overall design parameter for the project. So um, I would say it was very methodical. Uh, it was very, it was very well thought out in, from a step by step, and and where we had elements that we knew we needed to introduce, like the wainscoting. We need to put heat in the building. We we really don't have room to put it anywhere else. It needs to go against a perimeter wall. Um, how else can we make use of that, and how can we make it as subtle um, but distinct an element as we possibly can? Okay, I. I think that outlines some of the, the overall challenges that you encounter, and I, I think you both accomplished it very, very well in both of those projects. So not seeing any further questions, but uh, we'll conclude our webinar for today. And I can't tell you how much uh, we appreciate our presenters being here to tell us about these great projects, and, and thank you also to everybody who attended. Some of you will be back on Thursday when we'll hear about some creative repurposing of two historic schools. Then next Thursday, we'll learn about Wadiscaman Heritage Park and the park's work towards becoming a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And there are some late registrations available. I did put the contact information in the chat, which I will leave open for a few moments. So thank you to everyone again.